you are watching Redicon. Okay, now let's have a look at the nomenclature for disc disease. When disc has herniated, let's call it disc prolapse just to have a broad outline of all types of disc extensions beyond the end plate margin. So it can either be symmetrical presence of disc tissue circumferentially, say 50% or 200% of the disc margins beyond the edges of the ring apophysis, which is described as bulging disc or bulging appearances. It is not considered as herniation. Bulging or prolapse remain very descriptive terms to describe the contour or shape of the disc and it is not really a diagnostic category. When the disc bulge is present circumferentially along 360 degrees of the disc margin, it is called symmetrical disc bulge. A symmetrical bulging of the disc margin is between 50 to 100 percent of disc circumference or between 180 degrees to 360 degrees of the disc circumference. It is seen in cases of severe scoliosis and again not considered as a form of disc herniation. If the disc herniation or disc prolapse covers less than 50 percent of the circumference of end plate or disc margin, it is called disc herniation. When it is between 25 and 50 percent, it is broad based disc herniation, while if it is less than 25 percent or 90 degrees of the disc circumference margin, it would be a focal disc herniation. Let's look at focal disc herniations a bit more closely. Focal disc herniations may take the form of protrusion or extrusion based on the shape of the disc herniated material. A protrusion is a focal asymmetric extension of the disc beyond end plates but is still in connection with the disc margin and the base is broader than any other dimension in the same plane usually. However, if any dimension of the disc is broader than the base in the same plane, it is classified as extrusion. Extrusion has higher chances of being cut off, getting detached and being absorbed, hence a better prognosis than protrusion. This can focally herniate in multiple directions. As seen on the left upper corner, a central disc herniation is right in the midline posteriorly into the thecal sac. If it can be either side of midline, it is classified as paracentral disc herniation. Away from the paracentral margin, just deep to the facet joints, at the level of foramen is called lateral disc herniation and outside the exit foramina, it is called far lateral disc herniation. This is another way to look at different points of focal disc herniation. The red one denotes central disc herniation directly impinging on the central canal. The orange is a paracentral disc herniation and has a chance of coming onto the nerve root earlier. Amber is foraminal or subarticular or lateral disc herniation. It is called subarticular in reference to the facet joints. While green is extra foraminal or far lateral disc herniation. Let's summarize all this. An abnormal disc prolapse can be more than half the circumferences of the disc, which means covering more than 180 degrees of the circumference and it is called disc bulge, which can be symmetrical, covering all 360 degrees of the disc, while it, or it can be asymmetrical when it covers less than 360 degrees but more than 180 degrees. On the left side of the chart you can see disc herniations which denote less than 180 degrees or less than 50% of the disc margin. Disc herniations can be broad or focal. When it is more than a quarter or less than a half of the disc margin, it is called broad based disc herniation. Or when it is less than a quarter of disc margin or 90 degrees, it is focal disc herniation. If the waist of the sac is lesser than the sac dimension, main sac dimension, it is called extrusion. However, if it doesn't have a waist and base is much broader, it is called protrusion. The extruded disc or extrusion of the disc can migrate, it can get sequestered or it can stay as it is. That just summarizes different types of abnormal disc and the way they can herniate into different areas. 
That was a way of describing the nomenclature for disc disease. Similarly, there are ways to describe the degrees of spinal stenosis and the radiological criteria. But you must remember that there is a great variation in the way different radiologists will describe disc disease as well as spinal stenosis. There has been extensive research and studies describing this variation, such as this study which describes that expert panel of 41 radiologists, predominantly MSK radiologists and neuroradiologists from Europe and UK, participated in a study which saw the variation and description of different ways to describe the disc disease and spinal stenosis and the survey results suggested that there is no broadly accepted quantitative criteria and only partially accepted qualitative criteria for the diagnosis of lumbar spinal stenosis. However, it is important to identify a set of rules and follow that for the consistency of the practice and better information of the clinical colleagues. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the notification bell for new courses. For more modules and radiology CMAs, please visit www.radicon.org.